Hello, I'm Kirk Johnson. I work for the Relic Center for Genealogy and Local History at the Central Library Branch of Prince William Public Libraries. Welcome to this short video presentation. The name of this program is Rolling Roads and Turnpikes, subtitled Northern Virginia Roads to the Civil War. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to briefly describe the development of the road network here in Northern Virginia. We're going to start on the eve of European settlement in this area, and we're going to uh, go all the way up to and include the American Civil War. While the coronavirus pandemic has certainly disrupted daily life, most residents of Northern Virginia would agree that life in this area often involves spending quite a bit of time in your car commuting from one place to another, whether for work or for recreation or for family activities. It's one of the few downsides of living in this great area. What you may not know is that your daily commute was often shaped by a road pattern that was in place long before the automobile. In fact, in many cases, even before American independence. In 2002, archeologist Heather Crowell was a graduate student at American University. That year, she completed her thesis, A History of Roads in Fairfax County, Virginia, covering the years 1608 through 1840. We'll be drawing on this thesis for some of the information in this discussion. In the conclusion, Crowell argued that one aspect of the road pattern in early Fairfax County was that it was still replicated today, that aside from the interstate and some parkways, the major routes through Fairfax County were similar, if not in many places identical, to the road pattern uh, predating the Civil War. As we shall see that what was true for Fairfax County it was equally true for Loudoun, Prince William, Arlington, and other areas uh, in Northern Virginia. If you ask 10 different people to describe to you exactly where Northern Virginia is, you'll likely get 10 somewhat different answers. However, most people today would would agree that roughly speaking, Northern Virginia uh, is the largely suburban uh, area that is uh, part of the greater Washington DC metropolitan area. For our purposes, we wanna forget that definition a little bit because for one thing, Washington DC doesn't even exist when our, our period begins. But also we wanna focus a little more narrowly on the corridor uh, of Fairfax County and Loudoun County also pulling Prince William County and uh, to a lesser degree Fauquier and some areas further west of Loudoun into, into the discussion. This is a Northern Virginia that developed long before uh, the rise of Washington DC as the national capital, long before the metropolitan area that we now all live in uh, even existed. One primary consideration when looking at the development of the road network in Northern Virginia or in any region uh, is the topography, the actual lay of the land. This geographic regions of Virginia map shows the major geographic regions of the Commonwealth, uh, starting in the east uh, to the east of the line going from Washington DC through Richmond uh, is the Tidewater region. The next region west is the Piedmont region. And as you can see, much of Northern Virginia falls within the Piedmont. The narrow band of land uh, just west of that is the Blue Ridge Mountains. And then the next somewhat wider uh, region uh, is the Shenandoah Valley. There's also a little bit of the Appalachian Plateau, as you can see near Kentucky. And that, of course, uh, is the region that takes up much of West Virginia, which uh, during the era we're speaking of was uh, still part of, of uh, Virginia. So the fact that the Northern Virginia was almost entirely in the Piedmont is, is significant. Uh, the Tidewater, again, east of the fall line, uh, is, is, a, is a low line area with gentle elevations moving from the, the Chesapeake and the Atlantic going west. And ships and boats coming from the, the Chesapeake could sail rather easily up the river until they got to the fall line, the, the line that uh, separates the two regions. Because of the, the, the rapid rise in elevation at that point and the, the presence of waterfalls, uh, seaborne navigation was no longer possible. And it, it of course, also interrupted uh, boats coming downriver uh, from further west. 
This meant that uh, early water transportation uh, was not really possible in the Piedmont. And so that's going to uh, affect the development of transportation and settlement uh, in Northern Virginia uh, from the colonial period on. Indians have lived in Northern Virginia for thousands of years. The archaeological record of the different native peoples who've lived in this region is quite rich and new discoveries and new ways of looking at existing scholarship continues to enhance our understanding of the, the, the varied history of Native American people in this region. However, for this presentation, we're going to start just on the, on the, on the cusp of European colonization in, in Virginia, specifically the English colonization starting in 1607. This map of the Chesapeake area, and uh, this is the Virginia and what would later become Maryland uh, area of settlement, uh, shows on the left the large number of, of native settlements uh, that were part of the Powhatan Confederation. On the right is a, a map of the many early English settlements, uh, beginning with Jamestown and then moving up the various rivers and, and inlets into the Chesapeake Bay as English settlements slowly worked their way up the, up the tidal rivers of Eastern Virginia and what would become Maryland. Because the peoples of the Powhatan Confederacy largely lived along the shores of the Chesapeake and the, the banks of the many rivers and streams which fed into it, they tended to rely on water <laughs> transportation for travel, trade, and so forth. However, we know from archaeological discoveries and from later colonial records that there were a large number of well-established trails and roads used by Native people, uh, some of which uh, were later incorporated into early colonial roads because they already had mapped out the best overland route. These Indian trails often uh, followed the ridges of, of land in between rivers and streams, which made overland travel quicker and, and also uh, in line with geographic features. Although the full extent of this uh, Powhatan tr uh, overland trail network is lost to us, later scholars were able to map out the trail network at the interior of the country, which was had been used uh, by Native people for centuries uh, prior to European colonization and, and uh, intrusion. Uh, this map of the, the known trail network of the southeast United States uh, in the early national period uh, shows how dense and widespread this trail network could be. So uh, the Powhatan people, along with having uh, waterborne transportation, thanks to their access to the Chesapeake, also would have uh, very easily been able to cross the Blue Ridge Mountains and, and access a continental trade network. Virginia school children know that in 1608, only a, roughly a year after the initial settlement at Jamestown, John Smith had already led the first English exploration up the Potomac River to the region we now know as Northern Virginia. Despite this, however, it would be quite some time before uh, the English would colonize and settle this area in any large numbers. For the first several decades of Virginia history, uh, colonization settlement was largely restricted uh, further south in the Tidewater region that we discussed earlier. This means that uh, for the first several generations, uh, the, the Virginia colony developed in an area uh, with easy access to the rivers uh, and, and streams that fed into the Chesapeake Bay and in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the Tidewater region was, of course, east of the fall line, which meant that ships and boats could often travel uh, far up from the Chesapeake, often to the, the very shores of the plantations that the English built further and further inland. So therefore, roads in the early colony were largely restricted to local concerns. This picture by Carl Rakeman actually depicts the meeting uh, at which the very first road law in Virginia, in fact, the first road law in what later became the United States of America, was passed way back in 1632. This law was based on earlier English law, uh, which had placed the responsibility for the building and maintenance of roads at the parish level. 
Uh, for quite a while, the uh, Virginians followed this policy. However, uh, there were problems with this. In England, parishes were small, relatively densely settled, and well-established. In Virginia, on the other hand, parishes were geographically larger, uh, but, but uh, much more sparsely populated, and, of course, were often being uh, built uh, in, in terms of European inf infrastructure uh, from scratch. There just simply weren't enough laborers or enough taxpayers to, to make the parish system functional. So later, the Virginians would adopt a county system, and this, uh, this policy of, of vesting the, the control uh, and authority over the road system was left in the county uh, level uh, until after national independence. Although this was some improvement, uh, the counties would often still be uh, far too small to build uh, any piece of a larger uh, systemic road network. Uh, however, again, in the Tidewater region, this was less of a problem. Roads did not need to be part of a larger uh, network, nor did they need to facilitate long-term trade. Roads largely existed to connect people to churches and courthouses and to allow for a limited amount of overland travel uh, uh, et cetera. So this was the legacy of the colonial road system uh, in the early 18th century uh, when Northern Virginia really began to be settled and developed. In the 1720s, the colonial governor, Alexander Spotswood, took two actions which would hasten the English settlement and development of Northern Virginia. The first, was the forcible expulsion of the remaining Indian peoples uh, in the area. Having removed the indigenous people uh, fr from their, their homeland, uh, the governor also created a new county, Spotsylvania County, to encompass the entire region. Uh, by creating a, a, a county, uh, this allowed for local government to be established, a, cor a court, uh, rule of law and the surveying and uh, of land and the parceling out of of land ownership. And so colonists from the, the colony began to move into Northern Virginia and they brought with them the laws and social structures that they developed over a century uh, in the Tidewater. One of the most important facets of, of the colony that came with them was the development of tobacco as a cash crop. By the early 18th century, Virginians had settled on an economic system in which the production and export of tobacco produced by captive labor, first uh, largely white indentured servants, but by this time mostly enslaved people of African descent. And so this, this, met this uh, mode of economic production uh, was moved from the Tidewater area up to Northern Virginia and this would create uh, new challenges right away. Well, in the Tidewater, uh, plantations for generations had been built uh, along or near the water uh, and the many rivers and streams leading to the Chesapeake uh, in Northern Virginia because it was almost entirely west of the fall line. This was not possible. From the very beginning, Northern Virginia plantation owners needed to transport their product over land uh, to the fall line where there would be ports such as the new town of Dumfries and the later town of Occoquan, uh, where the tobacco could then be shipped on by sea. The answer to this uh, challenge was to create what were known as rolling roads. And these were literally roads where large uh, round containers known as hogsheads uh, full of hundreds of pounds of packed tobacco were turned on their side, uh, attached to oxen or later horses, and rolled as a giant wheel. This, this picture by Carl Ratzman shows uh, a, a typical rolled tobacco hogshead being brought to port at a wharf. Uh, the, to the left are probably the owner and a tobacco inspector or per perhaps the ship captain. Rolling roads often followed uh, the routes of earlier Indian trails. They tended to uh, travel along the, the high ridge 
uh, between different streams and runs because uh, this land was uh, uh, relatively easy to clear and would not uh, get pulled down by the weight and gravity into a river or stream. Also, uh, it would parallel uh, the rivers and streams headed down towards uh, the fall line. Many roads today in Northern Virginia uh, follow the same routes of these early rolling roads. There is at least one rolling road here in Northern Virginia, but other roads, including Ravenwood in, in the uh, Annandale area or uh, even Dumfries Road, Highway 619, uh, follow the routes of these early rolling roads. And um, th they're, they were the first true commercial throughways uh, overland uh, in the, the Northern Virginia area. For the next several decades, the population of Northern Virginia would grow and expand uh, west. The original county of Spotsylvania would be divided and subdivided again, uh, creating many of the counties that still make up the region, including Prince William, Fauquier, Fairfax, and Loudoun. The practice of tobacco planting and, and the use of wide-scale captive labor on plantations devoted to the single crop uh, defined a much of the early development of the region. However, there were, there were limits to the, how much uh, the population and the economy of Northern Virginia could grow. Uh, because of the fall line, uh, from the very beginning, uh, Northern Virginia plantation owners were reliant on rolling roads to get their product to market. Uh, this also limited uh, the ability to uh, transport uh, other goods uh, and to uh, create two-way commerce uh, uh, involving any bulk commodities. The road system that had been developed uh, through trial and error in the uh, earlier colony uh, had been barely adequate for the needs of the Tidewater region. In the Piedmont region, uh, making up Northern Virginia, it was even less adequate. Uh, the, the, the county road network uh, did create uh, uh, a number of, of local roads that were of utility uh, in their immediate neighborhoods. And if you want to do further research, uh, the uh, Prince William uh, order books uh, provide uh, insight into the development of the road, road system in Prince William County. Uh, the Virginia Transportation Research Council produced a, a uh, well-organized uh, and indexed uh, book, Fairfax County Road Orders, 1749 through 1800, that uh, does an even more thorough job uh, laying out the degree to which the county government participated and directed the development of local roads. However, uh, the, these roads, again, were uh, local in nature. Uh, although the county government oversaw them, it was still up to assign surveyors to do the actual work of maintaining them. The degree to which the county government uh, could enforce uh, this development was was mixed. Uh, and so uh, throughout the late colonial era, Northern Virginia saw a development of a handful of these rolling roads running generally uh, northwest to southeast, and then a, a, a dense but uh, incomplete network of local roads of varying conditions and quality, allowing for local traffic, local trade, but but uh, very little, if any, long, lar large scale or long distance commerce. With the coming of uh, independence came other demographic and economic changes. Uh, for one thing, uh, tobacco was declining in importance and utility as a crop. Uh, tobacco tends to deplete the soil rapidly, and also the, the sale of tobacco was highly dependent on fluctuating demand in Europe. Independence from Great Britain had challenged uh, Americans uh, who were reliant economically on the ability to export their commodities. So for these and many other reasons, Northern Virginia planters and farmers began experimenting with other cash crops. In Northern Virginia, the, the cash crop that increasingly became, came to replace tobacco would be wheat. And wheat farming would in many ways define the economy of Northern Virginia uh, in the late colonial period and through much of the early national period. Now, wheat is an ancient crop, well known in the old world. Uh, farmers had been growing wheat in 
Asia and Europe for thousands of years. It was a well-established crop, and the, the technology of using grindstones uh, powered by water mills to grind wheat into flour on a large scale uh, was well-established. So unlike tobacco, there was no learning curve for planters and farmers who chose to transition to this crop away from tobacco. The problem in northern Virginia was getting large quantities of ground flour to market. The rolling roads that had served uh, adequately for tobacco planters were just not up to the task. You could not roll large casts of flour um, uh, in an economically efficient manner along these somewhat meandering uh, roads down to the nearest uh, dock or port. Uh, and so uh, in order to make wheat farming economically vi viable, overland transportation had to be improved. Uh, the answer that uh, was soon set upon in the early national period uh, would be the innovation uh, brought over from England again of the toll road. Toll roads were already established in England and would be used throughout much of the early United States. In Virginia, uh, a private company would be incorporated. Uh, that would mean they were given the right uh, to uh, meet a public need, in this case a commercial uh, need, uh, in exchange for the right to uh, gain revenue to uh, reimburse them for their work. Uh, so therefore, the ter a turnpike company would be incorporated. They would be given the right to uh, build a road, the, the authorization to a forced right of way and to use uh, local materials and to draw on uh, local labor forces. Uh, oftentimes, enslaved labor was used, uh, rented by the company uh, to build the road. In exchange for this work of building and maintaining the road, the company was authorized to, to charge tolls or fees for the use of the road. Uh, while an ordinary person, a pedestrian or someone riding a horse could easily evade uh, people enforcing uh, the, the use of the road, uh, this was not true for heavier conveyances such as a wagon full of wheat. Uh, which if it tried to leave the road and, and go through uh, unimproved fields might very easily get stuck. And so throughout, uh, periodically on a toll road, there would be uh, toll stations uh, that would be blocked by a long wooden pike that would be lowered uh, until the uh, person uh, wanting uh, conveyance would pay the toll, at which point the, the pike would be turned up, allowing the wagon to continue on its way. Uh, Virginia saw a small number of turnpikes being built uh, shortly after independence. A large number of them, uh, in fact, the majority of them were built right here in Northern Virginia. And so in the early 19th century, a number of turnpike companies were incorporated in Northern Virginia. In 1802, the Little River Turnpike Company was formed. A few years later, in 1809, the Leesburg Turnpike Company was also formed. There were se several others uh, uh, built uh, or chartered during this era, but what's notable about these first two was that they were both built from Loudoun County directly to the Port of Alexandria, even though the city of Alexandria was at this time no longer part of the Commonwealth of Virginia. It had been uh, given to the District of Columbia and would remain in the District of Columbia until the 1850s. Despite that, investors hoped that by building these turnpikes, they would strengthen commercial ties between Loudoun County and the Port of Alexandria. Other turnpikes, including the aforementioned Fauquier and Alexandria, and several others uh, fed into this uh, new turnpike system that was being developed. On the, on the verge of the War of 1812, the state of Virginia took an unprecedented step it decided to take a more active role in the development of internal improvements as transportation was known at the time. A fund for internal improvements was set up. This fund uh, drew on the shareholder value of some of these incorporated uh, transportation companies uh, throughout the state that the, that the uh, state government had already invested in and then uh, pledged the government to uh, once uh, this investment was forthcoming to, to uh, invest uh, originally 40%, later 60% of the needed 
uh, startup capital for these companies. And then this would leave the state government as a shareholder. A board of public works was created to oversee this fund. The War of 1812 would interrupt this work, but uh, the state government would pick up where they left off uh, shortly after the signing of the treaty. And in 1816, the Board of Public Works was created and authorized to begin overseeing the use of the Fund for Internal Improvements uh, to develop transportation in the Commonwealth of Virginia. This painting by Carl Ratchman uh, uh, is a uh, reenactment of the creation of the Board of Public Works. The Board of Public Works would function continuously from 1860 uh, through 1860. Uh, the upcoming crisis that led to the Civil War uh, would put an end to its activities. The, the record of the Board of Public Works was extremely mixed. Uh, as a political creature, uh, it was prone to diffusing its resources and attention to a variety of product projects around the uh, state um, to meet a local and regional political interests. Also, uh, far too much uh, money and resources were expended on the ill-fated James River and Kanawha Canal that was intended to link Richmond uh, to the Kanawha River in what is now West Virginia. Uh, as a result, uh, the Board of Public Works got uh, less uh, production out of the resources expended than might have been expected. And the Virginia Transportation Network was a network in name only. It was, in many ways, a, a diffuse series of, of regional networks that uh, uh, ended up being less than the sum of the parts. However, the Northern Virginia Turnpike Network that ended up being centered around the Little River Turnpike ended up being something of an exception to this rule. And indeed, the Little River itself was something of an exception. It, it was the only turnpike company during the Board of Public Works era that returned dividends to its shareholders every single year. From 1816 through 1860, the Little River Turnpike managed to turn a small profit, which was returned to the shareholders every year. Even though the road was widely recognized as being well-maintained and usable, the Board of Public Works performed yearly reviews and uh, the B Little River Turnpike was always uh, uh, able to demonstrate that it was fulfilling its its function and deserved to have its charter uh, continued. As you can see from this map, other turnpikes were built to feed into the Little River, which turned it into a de facto trunk line for a small regional network that uh, pulled uh, wheat and flour from not only uh, Loudoun County, where it was uh, built from, but also Fauquier, Prince William, and then even across the Blue Ridge uh, from Clark and Frederick County, thanks to the Ashby's Gap and Snickers Gap Turnpikes. Uh, this meant that the Little River Turnpike was uh, uh, in some ways analogous uh, to the Erie Canal, which was uh, the exception that proved its rule. The Erie Canal was the only antebellum canal that actually lived up to its promise and its economic potential. The Little River Turnpike, in its own modest way, was in a similar situation. There were several reasons why the Little River Turnpike Company succeeded where so many others failed. One was its location. The, the Little River Turnpike connected the Port of Alexandria to the little town of Aldi, where a large mill was built uh, serving the wheat farmers of the area. The Turnpike would give easy access from the mill to the wharfs uh, and warehouses of Alexandria. It didn't hurt that Aldi, uh, the mill and the town uh, that grew up around it, was named by and owned by a man named Charles Fenton Mercer, who would be an important politician in Virginia state politics in the early national period. A Federalist and later National Republican, Mercer was a strong believer in internal improvements and played a leading role in the creation of the Fund for Internal Improvements and the Board of Public Works. He was certainly serving his own interests, but he saw his own interests as being uh, parallel with those of his community and of the state of Virginia in general. Mercer would later represent Loudoun County in Congress. Uh, because of his support 
And because of the uh, size of the Aldi mill, the Little River Turnpike got off to a good start. The development of later uh, roads feeding into the Little River Turnpike uh, would only uh, accelerate this success and lead it to its very unusual status as the only fiscally successful and continuously well-run turnpike in the entire Commonwealth. During this entire period, ads like this were common in uh, newspapers in both Alexandria and uh, Leesburg. Calls for subscribers to, to come to meetings to approve uh, new funding for the upkeep of these turnpikes uh, were critical in keeping the Little River Turnpike as well as others in the area up, up and running and able to meet the, the demand of producers and also their obligations to both the public and to shareholders. The Board of Public Works of this era was a disappointment. It was far from a complete failure. Many transportation projects were completed. Uh, a lot of good engineering was done. Um, and much of it was directed by the longtime chief engineer, Claudius Crozet, who served uh, at least two terms with the board. Uh, he often butted heads with them, uh, but as the chief engineer, he gave um, excellent advice. And when it was listened to, uh, often the transportation projects were quite successful. In 1848, Crozet produced this uh, map of the internal improvements in Virginia up to that point. As you can see, there's no real definable uh, statewide network, rather a patchwork of different projects uh, uh, transversing different uh, regions and localities. Let's take a look at the Northern Virginia part of this map. It's important to note uh, that this map only shows major transportation projects that have been funded and overseen by the Board of Public Works there would have been a denser network of local and private roads uh, giving individual farmers and communities uh, greater access uh, to the different turnpikes shown in this map. Still, you can see the Little River Turnpike network we looked at earlier, as well as the Leesburg Turnpike, uh, all of which are funneling a great deal of the agricultural pro products of Northern Virginia uh, to Alexandria and also on to Georgetown. The Ashby's Gap and Snickers Gap turnpikes, uh, both of which are still uh, roads in Virginia today, um, leading through towns such as Middleburg, Paris, and also Snickersville, uh, attempted to tap the Shenandoah Valley market. Uh, Shenandoah Valley was uh, considered the breadbasket of Virginia uh, wheat farming had always been important there. Uh, the Shenandoah Valley had been settled uh, in the colonial period by largely German settlers coming down the valley from Pennsylvania. Therefore, it was demographically, uh, historically, and culturally, uh, as well as economically, different than the Piedmont. It showed vision on the part of the turnpike companies to try and uh, get across the, the Blue Ridge Mountains and pull some of this wheat farming business east into Loudoun County towards Aldi. Uh, existing financial records of the Snickers Gap and Ashby's Gap Turnpike Company suggest they were uh, only partially successful in this endeavor. Still, you can see a fairly complete network of roads uh, throughout Northern Virginia uh, facilitating uh, the ongoing wheat farming business of the area, which remained a productive and lucrative enterprise right up until the Civil War. You mentioned that Heather Crawl's excellent work, A History of Roads in Fairfax County, Virginia, closes in 1840. Another fantastic resource for people studying the history of roads in Virginia uh, is uh, A Brief History of the Roads of Virginia by Nathaniel Mason Pollitt. He was the faculty research historian at the Virginia History and Transportation Research, research Council. This was published in 1977. Uh, Pollitt also closes his study in the year 1840. And uh, 1840 is a good year to call it a uh, a close to this era of road building because around that time a new technology started to get everyone's attention and that was the railroad.
starting in 1840, the Board of Public Works uh, kind of put an end to investment in new turnpikes. Uh, and aside from continuing to dump money into the, the money pit that was the James River Canal, uh, the Board of Public Works turned its attention to the building of railroads, uh, mostly in the eastern part of the state. Northern Virginia, of course, would see some railroad construction uh, before the Civil War. Uh, and uh, this is where a lot of the uh, time and resources the Board of Public Works had uh, w were uh, funneled. There would be another spurt of turnpike construction in the 1850s after the uh, ratification of the 1851 state constitution gave the western counties that would later become West Virginia uh, more political power and representation in the legislature. Uh, so the Board of Public Works uh, quickly incorporated a large number of turnpike companies in the west, some of which were actually built uh, before the outbreak of the Civil War put an end to the entire project. Northern Virginia, however, would see no new turnpike construction after 1840 of any note. Uh, a few more turnpikes, smaller ones, including a small Falls Church uh, turnpike of only a few miles, would be built uh, in the later uh, years after uh, the, the creation of the Board of Public Works to increase that network around the Little River and the Leesburg. But for the most part, uh, after 1840, the road network in Northern Virginia uh, would look the same. Uh, and again, as noted in the beginning of this presentation, uh, many of those roads survive today. The Little River Turnpike itself that you can drive on uh, from Aldi uh, all the way to Duke Street in Alexandria follows almost exactly the same route. Uh, it was a very straight road when first surveyed, and there's only a few places where minor straightening was done to build the modern throughway. The Leesburg Turnpike is the same, as is the Snickers Gap, Ashby's Gap, several others. I already mentioned that many rolling roads uh, of the colonial era are still uh, to be found on uh, road atlases uh, in your GPS today. And so this kind of brings a close to the road network of uh, Northern Virginia prior to the Civil War, although there is a sort of a coda to this chapter. Far from the most important consequence of the war. I did mention that uh, the outbreak of the Civil War did bring into an end the Board of Public Works as it had been constituted in the Board of Public Works era in Virginia transportation history. An interesting congruence between the earlier forms of transportation funded by the Board of Public Works and the later developments that would replace it occurred right here in Prince William County. The Battle of Bull Run was uh, named after the Bull Run uh, that ran uh, through the area uh, that was contested by the Union and Confederate armies. One of the most notable landmarks in this battle was the stone bridge that crossed the Bull Run. That was an, uh, an important crossing point for the two armies. It's uh, some people forget that the stone bridge was part of the Fauquier and Alexandria Turnpike which had been chartered in the early 1800s and was part of the Little River Turnpike Network that had made Northern Virginia wheat farming a prosperous and, and viable venture for so many decades. The fact that this battle was fought in large part to control a junction of two railroads, um, this, uh, and so this battle also saw the destruction of this stone bridge that had been built under the auspices of the Board of Public Works to maintain this turnpike represents in a small way the, the passage from one earlier form of transportation to another. Turned out the Civil War ended up providing us some snapshots of the transportation networks in Northern Virginia and other places. Armies needed detailed information on the lay of the land and so uh, a large number of maps were drawn up uh, by both Union and Confederate forces during this era. Uh, the, the maps that have survived from these surveying efforts give us a better look at the details of roads in the area than uh, we would have had otherwise. In 2015, a road crew doing uh, maintenance on the uh, Virginia Highway 123 at the juncture with Braddock Road just across the street from George Mason University 
found the remains of what turned out to be a so-called corduroy road. Uh, called that because the road was reinforced with uh, a, a cross crossing of, of boards and logs that allowed wagons to be pulled across it uh, without sinking into the mud. Archaeologists came and examined it and largely believe this road had probably been built during a civil war to facilitate uh, Union troop activity uh, in the area. Interestingly, the, the, the Civil War road seems to have paralleled the existing road that is there. Another reminder that uh, the road network we drive on here in the 21st century is quite literally built upon a road network that uh, has existed a long time ago. Uh, so think about that in your next uh, daily commute or the next time you're uh, leaving or returning to this area. Uh, very often the roads you're driving on, the route you're taking was mapped out a long time ago and, and the shape of Northern Virginia, uh, the, the development of settlement and, and work still sometimes follows patterns that were laid out by uh, Indian people, tobacco farmers, wheat millers, and Civil War armies. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting. As you can see, there's a lot to know about the road network in Northern Virginia, and there's plenty more to read about and plenty more research to do. Uh, besides the books I mentioned by uh, Heather Crawl and Nathaniel Pollitt, there are also uh, uh, other uh, publications, some uh, unpublished dissertations and dissertations on the Board of Public Works and the development of transportation in Virginia. Uh, order books from different counties, including Fairfax and Prince William, are a wealth of information on, on early roads in Northern Virginia. And the Library of Virginia has an extensive collection of materials of the Board of Public Works, including maps, surveys, financial reports, uh, annual reports, and correspondence. Feel free to come into Relic uh, if you want to look at uh, some of these materials or ask us to help you uh, find uh, where some of the others are. And again, uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this.